it's a pleasure to have you all join today. And I was just thinking we are already in the eighth month of this particular year. And it has been almost, I mean, more than a year since we have been doing this online worship. Uh, even though we are constrained in being able to meet each other, nevertheless, it is, uh, we must give thanks to God that we have been able to keep in touch. And so uh, we are grateful that we have this platform on which we can uh, connect with one another. Thank you for taking the time to do so this morning. And I was uh, just remembering, uh, you know, my childhood uh, and the things that we use you know, to, uh, to play the, the, the kinds of toys that uh, we invent as, as children. In those days, we did not have uh, computer games and video games, but we used to invent things with implements, you know, like, for example, I don't know if some of you might have done that. We used to take an old cycle tire and we used to make it into a toy and we used to, you know, run around in the, in the yard or in the road. One of the things I, I clearly remember is we used to try to imitate uh, people with bow and arrows. We used to make a bow, taking a branch of a tree and uh, make bow and arrows and pretend we are in a battle. And we used to have well, one of the things we used to do is cowboys and Indians. <laughs> we used to uh, pretend as though we are in some kind of a battle. Uh, um, so we used to have these so-called make-believe enemies and we used to bide our time playing in that uh, manner. But of course, as we grew up and as I grew up, all those childhood fantasies just faded away. But as we, as we grew up, obviously, there were other battles we had to fight. Uh, there were not battles that we fight with guns and weapons, but we had to fight various obstacles in life as we came across difficulties and trials and uh, problems. There was a battle that we continued to had to fight. And I still remember going back uh, many years and in this fellowship, I was baptized at age 17. And I still remember Bertram was part of that contingent that got baptized. <laughs> so we were born again on the same day, <laughs> spiritually speaking. Uh, but as I got baptized, I began to realize that there were new battles to fight. But a battle to remain faithful to God, to fight temptation, the pulls of the human nature, the worldly pressures that come as we lived our lives as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as we accosted these situations, uh, we had victories. We also had failures, uh, many disappointments, but the battle continues. And I'm presuming that all of you are familiar with these battles that we have on a regular daily basis that we fight. And these battles as physical human beings will remain till our dying day or our glorification day, whichever is earlier, right? And, you know, the Bible acknowledges that we are in a battle. Uh, and uh, we are reminded that we need to be vigilant. We need to be ready to continue to remain uh, in, a, in, a, in a mode where we recognize that we have to fight certain battles. And interestingly enough, the Bible also reminds us and tells us that we have resources. God gives us certain resources to fight these battles. And as we have read in the scripture today, it is called the armor of God. 
as we were led in the reading by Josephine in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told about the armor of God. Isn't it interesting that uh, the apostle mentions it or terms it as the armor of God? He doesn't use the word weapon. In other words, perhaps he's alluding to the fact that our battle is more defensive rather than offensive. All we have to do is defend ourselves, the offenses done by someone else. And as we go along to study the scripture, uh, we will see how, uh, you know, where the defense and the offense comes in. So today for the sermon, and if you would like a title to the sermon, uh, you could title it The Armor of God, because I'm going to discuss each one of those pieces of armor that is mentioned by the apostle. And so I want to lead you into a study of this passage. Uh, and as we do that, I want us to all be reminded that this uh, situation we are in and the battle that we are in, we have the victory. The victory is a foregone conclusion. Uh, we know that the victory is ours because of who is actually fighting the battle for us. So let me then uh, just bring up on the screen that particular uh, scripture. We will look at the first part of it and just pick up some very important points that we need to keep in mind. I'm presuming you can see my screen. Uh, <clears throat> Manoa, can you see my screen? Okay. So we are in Ephesians chapter 6 and notice beginning in verse 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Now, you, we must uh, know that the apostle here is writing to the Ephesian church, uh, Ephesus, the, as a city was actually, some historians call it the throne of idolatry because there was so much of idolatrous uh, activities going on in that city. And you may remember that a famous temple dedicated to the goddess Artemis was built in Ephesus. But the apostle Paul, as he preaches the gospel, he begins to see that a fledgling church was beginning to take shape and being established. And as the church began to grow, they faced many difficulties. And the apostle was writing to protect the church, to warn them about certain things. And this is what he writes to them. And I would like you to notice once again on the screen uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Notice what I have uh, highlighted in yellow, it talks about the schemes of the devil, cosmic powers over present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And this translation is from the ESV version. And so I highlight those points for us to ask the question, who is our enemy? You see? I, I, I presume you may have read that uh, the first rule of combat, you know, for a, from a military perspective, the first rule of combat is to know your enemy. You need to know who you are fighting and so that you might have and gain an advantage to be able to fight well. So notice who the enemy is. It is not flesh and blood. As the apostle says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, 
people are not our enemies. We are not fighting against people. We are supposed to love people. Jesus Christ loves people. God love, loves people. And we are, as disciples of Christ, to love people, not to fight them. But unfortunately, the real enemy has fooled us and made us to think that we are supposed to fight one another. And that is so unfortunate. And even in, you know, unfortunately, even in the Christian world, we sometimes are more focused on fighting people rather than the real enemy. And so the apostle is helping us to understand the real enemy is a very sinister enemy. All right. Uh, a very surreptitious enemy, a cunning and crafty enemy. There is a force behind what we can physically see. And it comes uh, in the form of temptations. It comes in the form of false ideas and deceptions. And who is this real enemy? The real enemy is the schema called the devil. That is what the Apostle Paul wants the Ephesian church to understand. That there is a spiritual force of evil in this world that is manipulating people and deceiving us to think that people are our enemy. No. It is unfortunate that we, that this spiritual force of darkness is actually turning people into enemies, not that people are really enemies. He turns people against one another. And unfortunately, even in the church, he turns Christians against Christians. Isn't that very sad? And we keep fighting one another rather than recognizing the real enemy that is out there. And so the apostle is helping us to understand once you know this real enemy, that we cannot fight this enemy with guns and ammunition. We cannot fight this enemy with knives and uh, AK-47s and grenades and IEDs. <laughs> How are we fight this enemy? And that's where the apostle tells us we are encouraged to take up the armor of God. He calls it the armor of God. Because this enemy is a formidable enemy. We cannot withstand such an enemy with, you know, uh, physical, uh, what do you say, weapons. Uh, we need God's armor. In, 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 in one sense, we need God to help us, you know, in this fight. Because we do not have weapons that can defeat an enemy such as this. So, Paul in this uh, treatise in his letter to the Ephesians tells us that we have to resist by putting on the armor of God. And so the question is, what is this armor of God? Let me then read the second portion of the scripture. I will bring it up on the screen for us to read. Uh, the second portion of the scripture is reading, uh, continuing to read from verse 13. Is uh, the, the apostle says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, he says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darks of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Once again, I've highlighted in yellow those specific words that the apostle uses to help us understand what, what is the armor of God. And he makes a very interesting contrast between, you know, uh, the physical clothing that we wear and 
connecting it to a spiritual perspective. And I think it's a very interesting thing to see what the apostle is saying. Okay, so I hope you have been able to see uh, uh, all of those. And let's take them one by one. He first talks about the belt of truth. What is this belt of truth? Now, when the word truth comes, the first thing that comes to my mind is who is the truth? You know, I don't ask what is the truth? Because from a biblical perspective, we are supposed to know who is the truth. And I'm sure you will be able to answer that very important question in, in, in GCI, we have focused on the who question quite a bit. And I hope you and I will be able to answer it. Who is the truth? And John chapter 14 and verse 6 gives us the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know that is being quoted by, uh, that is the words of Jesus Christ. And so, the real ultimate truth is Jesus the Christ. You know, the devil, on the other hand, is called the father of lies. And but John tells Jesus is full of grace and truth. And so when the apostle is telling us, put on the belt of truth. What he's really telling us is put on Jesus Christ because he holds everything together. And I'm presuming that when you put on your belt, for all of us who are men, you know, uh, we have to put on a belt lest an, an, an accident takes place. <laughs> and so the belt holds our trousers up, isn't it? And so you could say that Jesus Christ holds us together. He holds everything together. So we have to be girded with him like a belt. He makes the sense in a world that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, and talking about sense, we were led in the prayer by Jessica about uh, Afghanistan. What a tragedy. And for me, it makes no sense to see so many innocent people having to suffer and people having turned, you know, Disciples of Jesus having to go underground because of the terrible time they are facing. Notice how people have become enemies. But Jesus is our truth. And as his disciples, we must stand for the truth. We must reflect truthfulness in our lives. Right? So truth is not just facts and figures. Truth is a person. And the person of Jesus Christ is our truth, our ultimate truth, our real truth. In him, we have the truth. And he is the one who holds our lives together. He is the truth that keeps us together. And so we need to put him on. That is one of the armor of God. Well, what else does, he, uh, does the apostle tell us? He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, when you talk about the breastplate, it protects the breast. The breast is an area where we have vital organs, especially the heart. And I'm presuming I should also say the lungs. In this day and age of pandemic, of coronavirus, we know how important the lungs are. <laughs> you know, that is what helps us to breathe and take in the oxygen and be able to oxygenate you know, all the vital parts of the body. So these are a, a vital area of the body. And the apostle says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right? In other words, cover yourself with righteousness. Cover yourself with righteousness. Now the question is, how do we do this? Right? Can, do we have a righteousness to cover ourselves? Well, I mean, if you think you have your righteousness to cover yourself, well, uh, once again, remember, our righteousness is nothing more but filthy rags. So where do we get the righteousness? Ah, we go back to the real truth. Who is our righteousness? Jesus the Christ again. 
Did you notice a pattern emerging? The Apostle Paul showing a pattern with the armor of God? We will see that as we come closer to the conclusion. But Jesus is the one who puts everything right. He indeed is the righteousness of God. Like we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, in him we then have the righteousness of God. So we are encouraged to put on Christ. We are to put on and be protected in his righteousness, not ours, because we have no righteousness of our own. So we hide ourselves in him. And that is the safest place where the devil indeed cannot get you. So that is one, another aspect of the armor of God. Let's go to the third one. Shoes on your feet. Shoes for your feet, the apostle tells us. Having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now we all know that shoes help us to march. You know, help us protect our legs, help us to walk and run and climb. Now, obviously, it is not talking about Nike shoes. Or nowadays, I think the more popular brand is Skechers, right? <laughs> uh, the Skechers shoes, which is extremely expensive. But this is not the shoe that the apostle is talking about. Uh, the apostle is talking about, you know, to be ready to move forward with what? The gospel of peace, right? He is basically giving a metaphor for us to be ready, you know, to take the gospel of peace forward. As it tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, how beautiful it says are the feet of those who bring good news, right? Uh, so we, as disciples of Jesus, are bearers of good news, not fake news, you know? And may I, may I, uh, may I uh, reiterate that? We are not supposed to be the bearer of fake news. And how many times we keep getting fake news on WhatsApp, right? We are so quick to put all kinds of posts without checking whether it is fake news or not. We are not supposed to be that. And that's why I am very careful what I post on, 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 the, uh, on, the, on the WhatsApp you know, platform. We are bearers of good news, right? We are supposed to post good news and bring good news. It's, we are supposed to bring a message of peace. But now here is the question again. What is the gospel? What is the good news? What is the good news we are bringing? In, in a, the most simplest form, I can say the good news is Jesus Christ. Ah, do you see another pattern emerging? The truth, righteousness, and now the gospel, Jesus Christ. What we are supposed to be doing is you know, manifest Jesus in our lives, to allow Jesus to be manifest so that others may know who and what is indeed the good news. Okay, so that is the reason we are told to be ready to with, a, with the shoes on to take the good news forward. Okay, let's move to the next part of the armor. The shield of faith. The apostle says, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Here he says, the flaming darts or the flaming arrows will come our way, engineered by the evil one. And notice they are not just darts or arrows. They are flaming arrows. In other words, he is showing the intensity of the attack on us to trick us to distract us, to make us lose our faith in the one who is the truth, right? We will have many thoughts and messages that tell us 
that we are hopeless, we are losers, that we are useless. Correct? But we are supposed to use the shield of faith. What is the shield of faith? Obviously, the faith is in Christ, right? He is our ultimate victor. And we are told in the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. Do you catch my drift? Do you see the common thread in the armor of God? Jesus Christ comes in all over again. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. In other words, he is our shield. He is the shield that gives us the faith and protects us from the fiery arrows that comes from the evil one. Okay, let's move to the next armor of God. The helmet of salvation. Now, a helmet, and those who ride two, two wheelers know what a helmet is. And those of us who have seen battles, you know, on the TV know what a helmet is. It protects the head. It protects the brain. And the brain is the seat of your intellect, your reason. It helps us to make decisions. How do we, but the question is, how do we make decisions? We are told in the Proverbs that, there is a way that seems right to us, but it could lead to death. So we are to be very careful how we use the brain, the intellect, the reason, and how we have to make very careful choices, careful decisions. How do we make decisions? Ah, that is where we put on the helmet of salvation. Salvation? Where do we get salvation? Do you see another pattern emerging? Salvation is Jesus Christ our Lord, right? Our decisions are based on Jesus, looking to him. We are to put our minds on our salvation, who is Jesus Christ our Lord, right? Uh, we are supposed to be focusing on the realities of the gospel, which is Christ our Lord. We are saved in him. He is our victor. He has won the victory for us. And so we protect our minds, recognizing our salvation is in Jesus Christ. We have nothing to worry. We don't engineer our salvation. We don't manufacture our salvation. You don't have to go and buy a machine to see how you can manufacture your salvation. All you have to do, go to Jesus, put him on, put on the helmet of salvation. He is our salvation indeed. And finally, we come to the last uh, piece of the armor of God. He talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, when you read the, 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 the phrase word of God, you might immediately think about the Bible. And which is correct. The Bible is called the word of God. But in the context which the apostle is using these, this phrase, it may not necessarily be speaking about the Bible. As a book, he may be talking about the word of God, which probably means the gospel. Why? Because you see, the Bible was not complete yet. <laughs> the Bible was not complete at the time the apostle was writing these. Now, he could have a reference to the Old Testament, which was available, which he quoted from. But perhaps more specifically, he is referring to the gospel, maybe. The word of God is the good news of God, which is the gospel. And the word of God is probably an allusion to, an alluding to the living word of God. And who is the living word of God? There you have it. The piece of the puzzle is now complete. Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? The living word of God. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is nothing more but Jesus Christ. And we in the spirit have access to the very living word of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, right? And it is this sword, Jesus, who is our, remember I mentioned about the offense of the battle? He is our offense. He takes the battle uh, in the offense. All we have to do is defend ourselves behind him. Just put him on and he does the offense of the battle. We are just to do the defense. 
all right? And this sword slices into the darkness of this world, into all the lies the enemy throws out to us. This word, this sword, cleanses our heart, changes our lives, cutting out the bad habits and the mindsets, trimming the spiritual fat we many times gather over time. And so, what is the pattern you have seen with the armor of God? Perhaps, what is the armor of God, simply put? It is truth, it is righteousness, it is gospel, it is faith, it is salvation, it is the word of God. What is all that? What is one word, one name to, to encapsulate all that? Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, brethren, Jesus Christ is our, the armor of God. He is our armor. He is the place where we are finally safe and protected. Brethren, our strength is not in our ingenuity or strategies that we can, we can formulate on ourselves. But our defense is Jesus Christ. Only he can protect us from a formidable, sinister enemy like the devil. Even death cannot defeat us because Jesus Christ has defeated death, right? And so, brethren, let us remain strong in the armor of God, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. He indeed is our good shepherd. Let us hear his voice and seek protection in him. And in closing, I would like us to hear the encouraging words of President Greg Williams, giving us and telling us about the voice in the dark in the following video, which Praveen will play for us. In the military, In the military, they have a saying, the mark of a true chaplain is that your soldiers know your voice in the dark. You should have spent so much time with them and they trust you so deeply that even in the darkness and smoke of battle, they know your voice. Jesus talks about this recognition in John 10 verses three through four. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. We, as Jesus' sheep, know his voice deep down. In our spirits, we can recognize his voice calling to us through the circumstances of our lives and through his word. Studies show that even in the womb, a mother's voice soothes a baby. The heartbeat relaxes and the baby responds. Sound is deeply wired into our consciousness. So it's no surprise that Jesus would portray his draw on our lives as the sound of his voice. The actual image used here is probably of a communal pen where the sheep were kept. The shepherd came to the gate and called them and they'd be drawn by his voice. These aren't smart animals. Sheep wander off, they eat manure, they get snatched by predators. Their only hope is a protective shepherd. Jesus describes a shepherd as one who calls and leads. Not the driving abusive person, shepherds sometimes were. He calls gently, he leads with mercy. May we be so attuned to him that we know his voice in the dark. In the difficulties of our lives, in the loud, distracted age in which we live, may we hear his voice above it all, encouraging, leading, and guiding. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life.